Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Ara McCauley, and I'm the artistic director of the festival. And I'm pleased to present the ache of memory, fathers, sons, and loss. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the festival customarily takes place and where I'm situated this morning is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We hope you followed the sponsorship acknowledgement video that was playing before the event started. I'd like to thank the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council for their ongoing support of the festival. We're grateful to the, those organizations and individuals who support the festival. For this event, I'd specifically like to thank Steve Isco and Jan Walter, author patrons for David McFarlane. This event is an hour long and includes a question and hour pe answer period. Feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at any point during the event. You'll find this at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you're on a computer. There is also a raise your hand function. Uh, so depending on your device, you'll probably see a raise your hand or reactions at the bottom of the screen. Or if you're on your phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and we can unmute you when it's your turn to ask a question. As a thank you to you for continuing to support Kingston Writers Fest and joining us for the virtual edition of the festival, we will randomly select a pre-registered participant of the, this event following our Q&A to win a copy of David's book. And we are doing this for each onstage event throughout the festival. Now I am delighted to author, introduce this event's author, David McFarlane. Hi. David Hi. is a, hello David. Uh, David is a celebrated journalist and writer. His acclaimed family memoir, The Danger Tree, was described by Christopher Hitchens as one of the finest and most intriguing miniature elegies that I have read in many years. His novel, Summer Gone, was shortlisted for the Giller Prize. David's new memoir is Likeness, Fathers, Sons, a Portrait. Author and Globe and Mail columnist Ian Brown calls it an unforgettable book, saying as soon as you turn the first page, you're gone deep into the nest of his effortless storytelling. And author Elizabeth Say, Hay says, likeness is terrific. It's about the before and after of losing a son, but the before and after happen si simultaneously. That's the miracle of the book. David McFarlane has found a new form made of shards and broken pieces, and it's like music you've never heard before. Please welcome David. So David, um, I will now uh, turn the turn the event over to you. Um, we're so pleased to have you with us this morning to talk about this beautiful book. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you very much. Uh, what to say about this book? It's funny, it's a book that um, is uh, difficult to describe. It sort of defies the famous elevator pitch. Um, uh, it was a book that uh, was indeed uh, begun before um, our son Blake died. He died of leukemia. Um, but um, when Blake was in the hospital, um, I would sometimes read sections to him from the book that I was uh, writing, uh, uh, which was a book uh, in its initial stages that was going to be um, entirely about um, the portrait that John Hartman painted uh, of me and of a, a number of other writers. Hartman has done a series of, of portraits of writers um, that you may know of, a quite interesting collection of writers. And uh, he painted my portrait and has placed me um, in, in front of um, uh, one of his typical John Hartman aerial perspectives, um, in this case of Hamilton, Ontario, which is where I grew up. Um, and through a series of um, almost accidents, 
in a way. The, the painting ended up um, hanging in our living room in our house in Toronto. We, we never owned it. Uh, it was very generously loaned to us by um, Nicholas Mativier, um, uh, who is the art gallery um, owner and the, the dealer with whom John deals in Toronto. And um, uh, so there this portrait was in our house. And I found that uh, because of the detail of uh, Hartman's painting, uh, um, it drew me in. Uh, it drew me into memories of growing up in Hamilton. It drew me into um, memories of my uh, father. Um, my memories of his father. Uh, and uh, as Blake's voice became, as our son's voice became part of this process, um, his um, uh, journey, although I have to tell you he hated that word journey, uh, but anyway, his journey with cancer was, um, became part of the story as well. Uh, and so um, the bulk of the book was written after Blake's death, and um, I suppose in a way it was uh, my way of um, mourning, of grieving. I'm a writer, so I wrote. Um, and, um, but it was, it was a bit more than that. It was um, because his... Um, view of things, at least as far as I understood it, and his take on um, uh, what I'd already written and had shown to him. And he was not um, <laughs> um, always um, uh, uncritical in his remarks of, of what I was writing. Um, I, and of course, uh, eventually I realized that that criticism, and in many ways it was a generational criticism, um, was something that I wanted to include in the book. Um, and so I very much had Blake in mind as I was writing it. He was a kind of um, editorial voice uh, insofar as I could um, conjure up his take on things. In some cases, it wasn't difficult. In other cases, I was never quite sure if I was writing something that Blake would think was good or not. But at any rate, he was the kind of... Um, um, presence um, that was uh, guiding me through this. And strangely enough, um, uh, I found that a kind of weirdly uh, happy experience. Um, people have asked me, you know, wasn't it extraordinarily difficult to write this book? Um, you know, the death of a child is not something that um, is easy. Um, but actually, um, I didn't find it unpleasant. I didn't find it hard. In fact, it was quite a kind of, um, in an odd way, happy experience. It was sort of the year of magical thinking. Um, it, uh, the Joan Didion book comes to mind because um, there is a period of time when, um, um, and I haven't come to the end of that period of time, but uh, there is a period of time when the, the presence of of someone who is dead is so real that you can um, imagine, um, in this case, how they would think about um, something I'd, I'd written. Um, so at any rate, uh, it, as you can see, um, the elevator would have to be several hundred stories for me to be able to quickly describe what this book is, because it's not a big book, but it's it's um, a little bit complex in the way that memories are complex. Um, I'm also often uh, asked by people if, uh, um, <laughs> why um, um, I use time in such a, um, as Elizabeth Hay po points out, in, such, in sort of shards of memory. Um, uh, and my response to that has, is always that, that's just the way I think. Um, but also, I think it's the way people generally think. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to um, argue that the linear narrative um, that I think people are 
thinking of as being normal when they suggest to me that I, I write in comp complicated shifts of time. Um, I actually think that linear narrative is the artificial construct um, because none of us live in a linear narrative. At any given moment, we are thinking about what's going to happen later today, later this week, next year. Um, we're remembering things that happened in the past, sometimes in our distant past, um, sometimes something that happened just a few minutes ago. Um, we're thinking about people who their faces flash through our minds, um, some memory of something we were supposed to do. And for, anyway, we live in this kind of complexity of tenses, if I could put it that way, all the time. Um, and so I think that the kind of circular structure of, um, of likeness um, and the fact that um, instead of the story leading us eventually, let's say, to the death of Blake, um, in a way that is all, there all the time in the narrative. At, at a certain point, I began to think, um, I, I never really followed through on this thought, but I began to think that I was actually writing a book that you could pick up and start reading anywhere in the book, in the, book, in the way that people used to walk into movies um, in the olden days, uh, just walk in in the middle of the movie and sit until you come around to the, the line is, you know, where we came in and then you would leave. So I thought it's interesting to write a book that is circular in its structure in such a way um, that that doesn't follow the narrative thrust of um, um, of something about to happen, about to happen, about to happen, and then eventually it happens. Um, if it's something that is there all the time, that seemed to me to be quite fascinating um, because I think that's the way that time really works. And as people like Michael Pollan have pointed out in, um, in his recent book, How to Change Your Mind, this is exactly what psychedelic drugs tend to do, um, is that they seem to have a huge impact on people's perceptions of time. Um, certainly they did on, on mine. And one of the stories that runs through this book, that runs through likeness, is the story of my first experience with uh, LSD. Um, and <laughs> that um, unfortunately, well not unfortunately, that actually coincided with a golf game that I had with my father that I'd forgotten had been scheduled. Um, and uh, this was a story that Blake, our son, loved to hear just because it was so funny. He just loved to picture. Um, and indeed, our daughter Caroline enjoys or would enjoy picturing, you know, her stoned father <laughs> trying to hide the fact from his father uh, while trying to play golf on LSD. So it was, um, needless to say, full of comic uh, potential. And um, and so, uh, but there was a there was a kind of serious side to including the the theme of psychedelic drugs in this book, and that is that it uh, it gave me a very very easy um, and understandable way to talk about that notion of time being shattered into what Elizabeth Hay calls shards, um, and um, so. So the book is written in four parts. Um, each part has 18 sections. Um, so the golfers in the crowd will begin to recognize that this is the more or less the structure of a golf tournament. Um, and indeed the golf game with, <laughs> with my father and various other um, attendant ideas is, is really quite central. Um, to the book. And, you know, I think in the end, um, one of the reasons why this felt right to me to include this, I mean, it felt right because, because it was a story that 
I, I can actually remember quite clearly telling to Blake. So it's a way of remembering that story as a way of remembering Blake. Um, but um, it, was, it was also a kind of clue, I think, to um, how the book would be how the book would be structured. And one of the things that was very funny about that golf game with my father was that I managed to play golf okay, um, unbelievably. Um, uh, uh, but what I could not do, simply could not do, was keep track of how many strokes I had per hole. First hole, my father, and we finished, and my father just casually said, so what did you shoot? And I suddenly realized I had absolutely no idea, like no idea. Um, and so my father was a bit, you know, taken aback by this and we figured out that I had, you know, whatever I had. And, but then the same thing happened on the second hall. And then the same thing happened on the third hall. And even if I said to myself, you've got to keep track of how many um, strokes you're taking per hole, I never did. Uh, and so needless to say, my father found this a little bit weird, um, but anyone who has taken LSD and particularly in the kind of, you know, fairly massive dosages that we did in those days compared to the micro doses of today, um, you know, that like keep that, that at a certain point, the idea of keeping track of the strokes was so ludicrous that I just didn't do it. So anyway, the, the sequence of golf, the idea of um, one, two, three, four, five, which is the way we think our life proceeds, um, is shattered by the intervention of a powerful um, hallucinogen, um, but in a way that I think suits the, the story that the book is, uh, the story that the book is telling. And um, the fact that the story is funny, that was, that was what Blake liked about it, it always made him laugh, um, is also part of what I think um, is going on in, in likeness. Um, and that is, um, if I may say, um, and I probably shouldn't really, but if I may say, um, there are parts of, parts of the book that are quite funny. And people um, have reacted with some surprise almost to this as if a book about death, and in a way, I guess it is, um, can also be, be funny. But that's one of the strange circular things that happens, I think, with, with grief. Um, and especially in grieving um, someone, you know, very, very, close um, is that you have to ask yourself, so how do I continue here? Um, um, is it, how, can I, do I find things funny anymore? Do, do I take delight in a beautiful sunset anymore? Um, how do I conduct myself in a world where um, suddenly sadness, which, I mean, it wasn't, not part of my life, but it wasn't a part of my life in such a huge way. Um, suddenly sadness is, is, a, is a fact of life. How do you, how, and so anybody who is, who is going through the process of mourning someone grieving, um, you are always, at least I am anyway, um, asking myself, you know, so how, how do I go from here? Um, well, one of the ways I go from here is, is right. Um, you know, that, that's, that helps me. It, it's not gonna help you very much if you're not a writer, but, um, but it helped me. And the other thing that, that helps a lot is, is remembering things, um, remembering the, the joy that um, Blake took in, in things that were funny. Um, he had a great sense of humor. Um, uh, and, um, and how pissed off he would be um, if he knew that, you know, that, that we were all um, slouching around, you know, weeping and wailing all the time, which isn't to say that we don't do that to some extent. But 
it's also you find okay i'm here on this planet at this moment under this in toronto anyway blue sky and um uh you know so my um obligation to some extent is to um enjoy it uh um maybe even enjoy it more than um i enjoyed it before um so it was very important for me to write a book that was dealing with the death of um, Blake, um, but that was also funny. It would have felt very wrong and false um, to me if were were that were that not the case. The other objective, I guess, I had in writing this book um, was I very much wanted to write a book that was not at all sentimental. It's really hard to do um, because um, uh, we, I, I don't mean this as um, critically as it, it will sound, but we, meaning humans, enjoy sentimentality. Um, uh, we're drawn to it, it's kind of easy. It's sort of, you know, you get a response from people. But during the time that Blake was sick, which was about four years, one of the things I learned from him was to really distrust sentimentality, really, really, really distrust it, run the other way, try to have nothing to do with it. Um, because it's a whole industry uh, that surrounds illness and death and whatnot. And when you, um, when you experience death, um, kind of in a you know, big way, um, and there's nothing sentimental about it. There's nothing nice about it. There's nothing um, that makes you feel good about it. Um, and so likeness was a kind of, um, or is a kind of response against uh, the sentimentality that um, often surrounds this subject. One thing that's interesting about that to me is that sentimentality is almost never funny. Um, and funny feels right to me. Uh, in dealing with death, not exclusively, of course, obviously, but it feels right to me in a way that sentimentality feels wrong and false. Um, so um, what that meant was to a certain extent, which is, and, and this is a very funny thing for somebody to say who, who has written a book, which is about a portrait of himself, um, but, to a very great extent, it meant leaving me out of the narrative. I'm, I'm very much in the narrative, but my reaction to things is something that I didn't want to be part of the narrative. I can't tell you how many times I deleted and then I cried um, from the text. Um, as soon as I wrote something like that about what, how I felt, it, it rang false because it was um, asking you, the reader, um, to feel sorry for me in some way. Or, um, well, it's hard to, but, but it's asking you to enjoy that rush of sentimentality that I think often attends these things. And that would be something that I just don't think I could do because for me, the thing about writing, which is a, you know, like a really weird pastime. Um, but anyway, the thing to me about writing is the connection. What's great about it is that you, the, the writer, in conjunction with the reader creates a language that exists just between the two of you during the time that you're reading it. At the, mo at the moment I'm reading, or well, rereading 
um, Passage to India by Ian Forster. Now, Ian Forster is just a stunningly good writer. He's so smart, he's so funny, um, he's so observant. And because he was gay at a time when you had to be secretive about that, it gave him this really interesting kind of outsider perspective on, on uh, English society and in, in this case, the society of the Raj in, in India. But what's amazing to me is I'm sitting in my back garden in downtown Toronto, reading a battered old paperback of A Passage to India. And I have E.M. Forster's voice in my head, his voice. He's, he's telling me a story. And if I'm, um, and I'm not always the most attentive and best reader, but if I'm in a good reading space, um, if I'm wide awake, if I've just had a cup of coffee and if I'm into the book, then I'm really into it. I'm not really great about remembering the structure and the characters and novels after the fact. I'm not an academic in, in that regard, but in the moment of reading, I'm, I'm very, very, very much there. And I'm aware of the fact that I'm on this wavelength with, with this really interesting man who's telling me this really interesting story. And I remember when I was a child um, and I got sick with chicken pox or I don't know, one of those um, things that they have vaccines for. Um, uh, um, my mother brought home, um, I think, two of the three or maybe there are four Mary Poppins books. Now, this was before the Mary Poppins movie, um, and I'd never heard of Mary Poppins. I didn't know what these were. Um, they're written by P.L. Travers, um, and they're very different from the film. If, you, if you're not familiar with them, they're actually wonderful books. Anyway, as a, as a child, I found them absolutely wonderful, and I just love them. They're darker than the movie and kind of a bit weirder in a certain way. But to me, it was, well, lying there in my bed and reading these books, I had this voice in my head, this kind of really intelligent, um, um, wry, um, unsentimental, um, strange, compelling voice. And it was P.L. Travers' voice in my, in my head. And so that kind of magic thing, that connection between a writer and a reader is to me what this is all about. That's why, you know, you do this crazy thing is because every now and then you can, you can have one of those experiences where somebody picks the book off a shelf and begins to read and you have as the reader, as the writer, captured them in some way. It has to do with what they bring and it's one of the reasons that um, I'm always a bit skeptical about a book being, you know, referred to as being better than another book in a, in a, in a particular way because books remain very much alive in this sense that I am reading A Passage to India now in a very different way from the way I read it when I was a university student, for instance. Um, and so books change and evolve and sometimes they touch you and sometimes they don't. And, and it's almost kind of against my, my religion of writing um, for me to have anything to say about something I've already written. Because in a certain sense, I'm, I'm like not a good person to, to ask about it because it's the reader who is, and if the reader doesn't like it, then there's nothing I can do um, to change that because um, my job as the writer is to, is to make them uh, like it. But maybe if they pick the book up 10 years from now, um, they, will, they will like it. So um, at any rate, as you can see, the elevator ride is getting very, 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 very long. And um, there, are th there are aspects of the book that um, are there because they felt to me like they, they needed to be there. 
Um, and it had partly to do, or a lot to do actually, with introducing um, um, not so much Blake's voice because um, his, his, his voice isn't really all that present, um, but his presence and also his generational presence. Um, one of the themes of likeness is the fact that I grew up um, in middle class, white, Hamilton, Ontario, um, uh, a baby boomer. Um, I was born in uh, 52. So, you know, pretty much like right on the money in terms of the, of the demographic. And uh, period of time that I grew up in Hamilton, which I thought of as being the most ordinary time in the world, um, was a kind of miracle, uh, like uh, uh, it, uh, a miracle, a miracle that, um, that we thought um, was um, just the way things were. Um, no wars, no disease, um, general affluence, lots, lots of jobs. Um, one of the stories I tell in likeness is going um, for a summer job at Stelco um, in Hamilton, the steel company. And, you know, it was generally understood in Hamilton that if you were a student, um, you could get a job at either DeFasco or Stelco or one of the industries in town. Uh, so on my first day at, for my summer job, so I was a university student, so let's say, um, I don't know, April, May, something like that. I arrived at the main gate of Stelco and all the other students who had summer jobs were there. And there were practically, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact number, but about a dozen school buses, a dozen school buses. That's how many people, that's how many students had summer jobs that day, that, that summer. These were real jobs. These were union jobs. These were jobs where you could work for the summer and pay your tuition for university, uh, pay for an apartment for the year and have some money left over to go to the bar now and then. And uh, because that's the, way, that's the way things work. Well, the, the kind of world that I assumed was the way things were, was a world that only existed in the period of time when I was growing up in it. It's a reality that our children, that neither Blake nor our daughter Caroline um, ever experienced where they could assume that they had a summer job that would then pay for their, for their, for their year. They, they now, uh, Caroline now can't assume that they will live in a place that is without disease. And they are facing this environmental catastrophe that the wealthiest generation in the history of the world has left to them. Now, so you can start to feel a little bit of the anger, um, I guess, in my voice. And that's because it's not my anger, it's Caroline's anger, and it was Blake's anger. Um, when you lose a child, it's um, devastating. And one of the ideas that I wanted to introduce into the book, and this came by, through Blake's critique of the baby boom generation, is that we are all losing children. They're going to die because of the fucked up world we've left for them. Um, and we have no excuse. Um, there's no reason why we didn't pay attention to what environmentalists were saying 30 years ago. Um, but we wanted, you know, to all have our, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know the, the story. So I, it was very important for me to introduce into likeness the idea that um, um, we are all facing the saddest thing that can happen to parents. We're, um, um, well, we're, we're not leaving what we should be leaving. Um, for our children and, um, um, and our selfishness is, um, um, 
going to be something that's, uh, you know, that we'll have to live with, I guess. So anyway, um, all of which is to say that Blake's voice and, and Caroline's voice was really important to me in the book because I wanted it to be an examination in some ways of this period of affluence. Um, French uh, economic historians refer to it as Les Trente Glorieuses, the 30 years after the Second World War. When if you lived in North America, you were white, um, uh, you would have work, you would have um, a well-paying job, um, and the social infrastructure was in place that, uh, that, um, that supported a kind of public life. Um, not to say, you know, want to go back to that time. There were lots of things that were terribly wrong with it, but, um, but it was a, an unprecedented period of affluence. So I wanted to describe what that was like in a way. Um, you know, I thought, well, um, when, uh, well, when I was at university and I was um, trying to figure out how to be a writer, I, I, was, I was always sending things off to different places and, and trying to get work at magazines and newspapers and whatnot. And it was, wasn't easy. It's never easy to start off as, as anyone who has tried knows or is trying um, knows. And at one point, I remember thinking, um, that I couldn't get an assignment from the varsity magazine newspaper and I couldn't do this I couldn't and I remember thinking well what am I going to write about I, there's nothing I can I'm not I haven't nobody's given me anything to write about and I had this apartment in Cabbage Town on Sackville Street and the window looked across at a brick wall that was about three feet away and I remember thinking I'm just going to describe the brick I don't have anything else to write about. I'm just going to describe that brick wall. Um, and I set out to do that. And in a way, I felt the same way with likeness, where when it began, it was, when I began it, it seemed to me to be the oddest thing to be writing about middle-class white life, um, uh, the affluence of it, the... Um, I guess entitlement uh, is not wrong, but it was a kind of entitlement, at least at the, at the level of the middle class that, that I knew, um, where it was more ignorance than in entitlement because there was a kind of um, um, heroic quality to <laughs> our entitlement because we thought everybody was soon going to be so entitled. Um, it seemed that the kind of reality that, that we lived in, um, which was, you know, not wealth in the way that we think of wealth today, and it wasn't poverty, um, somewhere in, in between, um, was kind of the way that any, everybody was going to end up um, living. So anyway, I wanted this whole um, um, reality of that moment to to, to be there. Um, and Hamilton's a pretty good place to look at that reality because it was, um, uh, is uh, an industrial city um, uh, with, um, you know, with, with a pretty steady, um, you know, there were strikes and whatnot from time to time, but basically um, if you wanted to get a job in Hamilton um, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, you maybe you get it. You could get a job and a and a pretty well-paying job. Um, so the end of that period of time and the inheritance of our children of uh, um, a much more difficult world, um, much more stressful in the sense that. Um, uh, you can't just work a couple of months in the summer and pay for your, your university. Um, it's, um, I wanted that, I wanted that to be there. And so it seemed to me that it was important to have a kind of, if I was just, um, on my own, um, blathering away about, um, you know, my life, um, in being a middle-class writer in downtown Toronto, um, that seemed to me to be, you know, a waste of time. 
um, but to try to introduce the element of how another generation sees, uh, how generations see one another, be, be started to fascinate me. So it, I began to think more about my father, partly because the John Hartman portrait um, brought Hamilton to mind. Um, and my father had uh, was born in Hamilton, grew up in Hamilton, uh, lived his whole life in Hamilton. Uh, and his mother, uh, the, the same, she had been born and spent her entire life in, um, in the kind of, um, enclave isn't the right word, but, but, but in the, in the middle class of, uh, of Hamilton. And, um, so that world, which, um, I kind of, well, which I knew because I'd grown up in it, um, seemed uh, like such ancient history in a way, especially when I thought of it in terms of, of how it compares to um, Blake's world um, or Caroline's world. Um, in some ways, the comparisons were funny. You know, my father was um, uh, um, well, I, I, I can't say Victorian, that's not right, but, but his mother, was um, was Victorian, not literally Victorian, although there was a bit of an overlap. But but her worldview was Victorian, and so um, it, that became his worldview to a certain extent. And so I began to see this kind of um, shift of generations, um, beginning with um, with you know my father and. His father stayed Presbyterian, uh, church going, golf playing, professionals. My father was a doctor. His father was a doctor. Um, um, and that in comparison um, to the um, uh, world that, um, that Caroline and Blake were inhabiting. So anyway, so that's the that was an extremely long um, elevator pitch about the book, um, and uh, I'm not sure if we want to begin entertaining questions now. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, um, oh, we are starting there to get questions. <laughs> yes, um, if if you are open to them, then. Uh, Sure. All right. Uh, this is a lengthy one from uh, K. A. Knittis. Um, Dear Mr. McFarland, thank you so much for this, and please forgive me for asking a question about the baby boomer guild you spoke of. As a white woman of mixed background, white immigrant parents who grew up in the same era as you and who spent so much of my life from the 60s on engaged in women's rights and concerned with immigrant immigrant rights, anti-war environmental issues, OPERG, et cetera, et cetera, and have seen the horrifying rise in plastics and electronics and other waste continuing these past two decades as before. I wonder if you would consider changing your focus from a generalization about quote unquote white baby boomers to quote unquote alpha males and some alpha women in that generation if you think they are different from the present ones. Um, this doesn't take away at all from my appreciation of what you've reached out, uh, out to with readers within your writing. Hmm. Um, well, I, yes, I think the observation is, is correct um, to, I mean, uh, we're speaking in generalities, I think, to some extent, um, especially when we're speaking of generational distinctions. But if, if I understand the question correctly, um, I'd say I, I agree. I, I'm, I, I might even go so far as to say, let's not include alpha females in this, uh, in this because I think that um, um, male ego um, has, is largely responsible for the mess that we're in. Um, I think that's becoming clearer and clearer all the time. Um, that, um, that really, I think the great tragedy of our, of our time um, is that women are still fighting for uh, equal rights um, when clearly they should be leading us. So, anyway. 
Um, a uh, less philosophical <laughs> question here um, from Millie who asks, uh, what motivated you to become a writer? Um, what or who were your influences? Um, well, as I mentioned when I was speaking, um, it, 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 it begins with being a reader. Um, in one of the J.D. Salinger uh, short stories, um, uh, I think Seymour Glass tells Buddy, um, um, in order to be a, a writer, you have to first be a reader. And then you imagine what book you would most like to read, and then you write it. Um, and uh, there's there's some truth in that. And I think that uh, I mentioned earlier that P. L. Travers, who wrote the Mary Poppins book books, um, was one of was one of those things where a light bulb went off, where I realized that this was a kind of magic. Um, and so I think my earliest experiences were. Um, you know, maybe not necessarily the, well, no, for sure, we're not the great books. Um, uh, uh, nobody is going to list Scott Young's Scrubs on Skates and Boy on Defense as being, you know, classics of literature, but they were hugely important to me because they caught me at the right moment. I was, I don't know, 10 years old or something when I read those books. And, and, so it's not so much that I, the, that the books themselves as artifacts are important to me. It was that connection. So those early connections, when you're reading someone telling you a story that you are really, really enjoying and really into, and suddenly you realize that this is this, um, this kind of magical thing. Um, and it continues because it, involve, it evolves as you evolve. So I can remember, for instance, being at university and waiting for the new issue of Rolling Stone so that I could read Hunter Thompson's Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. Because in those days that was so new and so crazy and seemed to so capture the weirdness of Nixon's America that um, it felt like a kind of, um, you know, a, a pipeline between Hunter Thompson and me. Um, and so those were the things that really um, made me think that being a writer was something that I wanted to do because it seemed to me like almost being a magician that you could, you could create this connection with people. Um, earlier, uh, you, as an aside in your, in your talk, you, you sort of alluded to writing as um, maybe, a, a, I can't, remember exactly like a curious or a questionable past time and I wonder if you would expand on that. Well, um, I had an, an email exchange um, recently with Wayne Grady, who was a, a friend and, and a great friend of the of the Kingston Festival, I know. Um, and um, we were talking about about this and uh, and we concluded that it's like the old joke, the, the joke that's 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 referred to in the in Annie Hall, the the Woody Allen movie about um, you know the guy whose uncle thinks he's a chicken and what can do what can you do about that? And um, well, you could take him to the hospital, you could take him to doctor. Said, yeah, I would, but we need the eggs. Um, and uh, and so that's the thing about being a writer is if you're stuck with it. Um, you need the aches. Um, I don't know what else I would do with myself, to be perfectly honest. And um, uh, and yet, it's such a crazy thing. When you, you know, uh, you sit in a room by yourself for two or three years. You come out um, with something that you've been working on. Um, there are already a billion books out there. It's not like anybody is sitting around saying, gee, I wonder when the next book by David McCartney. And so it's like such a crazy thing to do. Um, uh, I remember um, I was doing some, uh, let's see if I can tell this story without, uh, uh, I, was doing some, I was doing some ghost writing and um, the subject of, the subject of the, of the ghost writer, wanted to know about my history as a writer. And he, he was not, you know, a, an avid reader. <laughs> and um, 
we were in downtown Toronto and he said, well, let's go into a bookstore. And, you know, have, have, so we go into uh, Indigo and we ask. And so you're led to, you know, like back behind down this corridor over here and on this obscure bookshelf, there's one copy of, of my book, the danger of this was then my one book, The Danger Tree. And so he takes this off the shelf. And this is a guy who's, you know, a millionaire. A anyway, he, he looks at the book and he says, um, and then he looks at me and he says, So you make a living at this, do you? <laughs> and, um, and that's the stupid, you know, like it's really, a, it's hard. It's lonely. Um, it's often heartbreaking. Um, it's maddening in the sense that you can write a draft that you think is fantastic. And then you, for some reason you put it away and read it a week later and you think, my God, it's terrible. How did I, was I, was I crazy? Was I on drugs? Why, how, why did I think it was any good? And so it will really drive you crazy. Um, so that's what I was on about is it's really, really not an easy thing to do. And I don't say that because I'm bragging about it. It just, that's just my experience. And, and yet um, there's nothing I'd rather do. So <laughs> you, you tell me, somebody, I need a psychiatrist to tell me why I do it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a common thing I hear from authors uh, and there's the two sides to it. The, when they talk about the process, there's nothing romantic or glamorous about it. And yet there's that compulsion that, that drive to do so, um, that, you know. Yeah, I will, I, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll modify my, um, my statement a little bit to say that um, when a book or a story or whatever it is I'm writing, when it's about three quarters of the way through the process. Mm -hmm. um, often when an editor is involved, um, then there's a kind of excitement and thrill that I just don't get um, and anywhere else. When things start coming together, when you have these moments where you think, oh, wow, gee, anyone would think I knew what I was doing. You know, the things start sort of falling into, into place that's very exciting mm -hmm. to me. Um, and that's, that's what makes it possible, possible to forget all of the horrible attempts at first drafts. Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> um, another thing, um, I know that authors don't necessarily uh, have a lot of say in the design of the covers of their books. Um, but it struck me when you were talking about um, in the book, how often you deleted the, you know, and then I cried. And then um, if you haven't seen the cover of the book, uh, it's, it stylized teardrops on it. Um, did you have, uh, were you part of the consultation process for that design? Um, very much so. And I have to, to really tip my hat to, to Doubleday Canada um, uh, and to Martha Kenya Forstner, who was my editor, um, and really the whole team at, at Knopf and, and Doubleday, they were, um, they were really wonderful about this. And it was not an easy c cover to arrive at. Mm -hmm. for, for one thing, there was the issue of the image of John Hartman's painting, which is a pretty central um, idea to the book. Um, and um, and that was complicated for various reasons, but to, to simplify, um, it was complicated because um, the painting, as wonderful as it is, and as extraordinary as it is, and I must actually, I should actually put in a good plug for John Hartman, because he was a great, great ally through all of this, and I found the process of his painting um, to be fascinating. Um, but um, uh, John was, um, mm, uh, it wasn't clear at all that the painting could work 
as a as a cover. Um, and in fact, it didn't work as a as a cover. We tried various ways to include it. Um, then there was this whole other thing that was really interesting. A great deal of what of what I write about the painting in the book has to do with the experience of living with an actual painting, so not a reproduction. Um, and that's really something that really surprised me about because we had the, the the painting in our house for this period of time, as it happened about the four years of Blake's illness, and because it was a living work of art. Um, it had this whole language that became part of, of what I was experiencing. Um, and so it seemed weird to put a reproduction of the painting in the book when I talk so much about. Um, and so there was a lot of discussion about would we include the image of the painting, would we not? And there were various iterations of the cover um, and Doubleday was very attentive to my um, um, my concerns, and I and I, well, partly because it was also their story, but partly because they both have excellent eyes. I asked my wife Janice and daughter Caroline for their views, and so they were kind of welcomed into the discussion by by Doubleday, and all of a sudden, um, th this cover appeared. Um, and I mean, not all of a sudden, the designer spent a lot of time working on it. And um, uh, and Kate Sinclair, um, and it just seemed right. It just seemed to kind of capture what I wanted to capture. And it seemed to avoid the whole issue of, um, is this a book about a painting? It seemed to, it seemed to do what we wanted the cover to do. I remember yeah. Louise Dennis saying that a cover should ask a question and this I think does that. It's a it's a striking cover. It's beautiful. Um, I also think it's unexpected um, aesthetically for what you might imagine going into um, a book that discusses the subject matter that it does. Um, and so it, it kind of I think it works well with with your desire to kind of challenge the reader's um, expectations about what they're going to find in the book. So. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I feel that very strongly. I think that it's an unsentimental cover mm -hmm. um, and it would have been a real disaster to have had a, a sentimental right. cover on this book. Yeah. Um, so we have only a few minutes left. So if anyone has been hovering on the edge of asking a question, um, I would invite you to do so now. Um, if not, I don't know if you have any final final words, David. Or... Uh, um, what final words? Uh, well, I suppose, um, I suppose that I just hope that, um, that people will, will, um, you know, I think it's, you know, not people aren't going to um, aren't necessarily drawn to the idea of picking up a book about the death of someone's child, and um, and uh, but I think it's I, I think it's um, and I'll put it this way: it's it's a book I'm very proud of, um, and um, um, I'm proud of the fact that um, the people who whose opinions mean a lot to me, um, um, hold it in high regard. So anyway, I'm, uh, it, it, it was a, it is a book that I'm, that I'm, that I'm quite proud of. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for um, taking the time to present to us today and to talk about the book. Uh, it is an absolutely beautiful book um, and and very unique, I think, as well. Um, we'd like to congratulate, We, as mentioned at the beginning of the event, we did do a draw for a book. So congratulations to Barb Love, who is a longtime supporter of the festival and has been a, uh, was uh, a volunteer at the very beginning. So that's wonderful. So she's won a copy of, of David's likeness. And a reminder that if you would like to pick up your own copy uh, to visit our official bookseller, Novel Idea Books, um, and if you're outside of the Kingston region, then we 
welcome you to support your local independent bookseller, whoever that might be. Thank you so much to um, all of you for joining us at Kingston Writers Fest. And uh, this is the last day of the festival, but there's still a number of events still to go. So uh, please do check out kingstonwritersfest.ca for the rest of our lineup. And once again, thank you, David. It was a thank you. Pleasure to be here.